Okay, friends. Today, zeros of quadratic functions. Not the worst lesson ever. Yes? After yesterday, just tough. So word problems are tough. If it takes you several days to meander your way through the homework of yesterday, don't feel bad. Those were tough. That's the toughest part of this chapter, I think. This is better. What are the zeros of quadratic functions? I'm going to write several things here. All the possibilities of what you might run into as far as how this will be defined. The zeros of the quadratic function are, uh-oh, pen, working, sort of working. Sort of not working. Well, let's do a little calibration here and see if I get this pen to work better. Let's see what happens. Oh, that pen's not working at all. Oh, no. Goodness, that pen is struggling. Okay. Switch pens. Okay, maybe we're going now. They tell me by maybe by Christmas I get my new active board. Well, that'll be my favorite Christmas gift. Okay, what are the zeros of quadratic functions? where the y value is zero. Yes? These are sometimes called the x-intercepts. And I should stop there. That, should, that should, should be the end of what I should say here, but I'll just add something that's coming so you're not surprised when it happens. When the quadratic function equals zero. If you're right with me, you're like, you just said the same thing twice there. I'm like, I know, but I just want you to be ready for the two possibilities of where this comes up. These are also sometimes called roots. <clears throat> roots. Roots allowing you to wear your Roots shirt in class for a couple of days. Yeah, Roots Canada. That's good. No, see, no good. That's no good. What do we got over here? What does that say? Ah, hmm. Illegal. Illegal sweater. And Palmer, usually you wear a Roots sweater, don't you? Roots sweaters are allowed during this chapter, but not the other ones. Go get a Roots sweater. Okay, well, how can this work out? Quadratic functions can have three different ways this can work out though. The most common way that people are used to is you could get two zeros. Now I'm going to write two different parabolas that have two zeros. And I'm going to write one on the left and one on the right. But I'm not saying they have to be on the left or the right. I'm just saying here's a couple of pictures. I just don't want the pictures to overlap. You could get parabolas that open upward that hit the x axis twice. They have two x-intercepts and I'll put giant dots there. So you can see there's one, there's two. I didn't try and make them go through nice values for you, which I often do. I'll often when I make up equations and put them on assignments and on, on homework, they'll often be through nice numbers. I'm not trying to do that here. But quadratic functions that open downwards, parabolas that open downwards can also have two zeros. It just depends where they are. So opening upwards or opening downwards doesn't tell you how many zeros you're going to get. Let me do the same thing with quadratics. We could get one answer. You could end up with only one zero. So here, you could get a, fun a quadratic function that comes down and just hits once. Shh.
or you could open downwards and just get one zero. They don't have to be all the way left or all the way right. I was just trying to draw a picture that didn't overlap, okay? I'm just trying to use both sides here. It doesn't really matter where the parabola is. But there's a third possibility that'll come up that might cause you stress, and I won't draw this in the middle just to show um, that it doesn't matter where these parabolas are. You could get one that goes like this, and you get no answers. And I'm not really saying too much about that right now. All I'm saying is you should be prepared. If you're doing a question and you get two answers, yeah, that can happen. If you get one answer, don't let that stress you. That can happen with quadratic functions, with parabolas. And if you get one that gets no answers, how could that happen? How can an equation have no answers? Well, hopefully you saw how in grade 10, but I'm gonna review it here and act like you haven't seen it before, but it's possible that we'll get something that we can't get any answers out of. Is this all fairly familiar? Yeah? My job just scraping rust off the knowledge in your brain react. Oh yeah, I sort of remember this. Do you have any questions there? More time? All right. State the zeros. Okay, so if I'm actually gonna ask the question, I'll give you a graph that probably goes through some nice numbers. You can just look at this one and go, okay, this one has, there's one zero there and one zero there. I don't know if I photocopied it big enough for you. Can you see the actual values there? Three, three and seven. X equals three or X equals seven. And maybe you'll write X equals three and x equals 7. You can write or or and. There's times in math where you can't write both or and and, but I understand both here. You can even write it like this, x equals 3 and then a comma with a 7 there. Almost starts to look like a point. Some mathematicians don't like that. They don't like when you write it like that because it gets a little confusing. But you can technically write 3 comma 7. There's two different x values. Uh, they're there, 2. This one had 2. What zeros does this one have? None, none, zero, none, yes? So we're not surprised by that in this situation. We'll be surprised by it when it happens algebraically. We'll be surprised, but we shouldn't be. Some parabolas have no zeros. There are parabolas that do not reach the x-axis. And then this one, I hope my diagram is good enough that you just look and say, oh, there's only the one there. X equals negative four. I said negative four, didn't I? And then I didn't write it. Negative four. I'd like to blame it on the pen, but it's not the pen's fault. I'm sad about my other pen. Look at, look at how long a life we've had together. Look, it's all taped up. It's just a mess. Still, it's, it's a lot like me. It's a giant mess, but it's still working. <laughs> it's sort of funny. Not really, but sort of sad. Any questions here? Pretty easy lesson? Yeah, not, not bad, okay? I know, because yesterday was, whoo, heavy stuff. Okay, this is why I photocopied it for you today, because it gets a little wordy here. A quadratic equation is an equation that can be written as ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b, and c are constants, and a does not equal zero. This is the one, eh? People see sentences like this, and this, this is why I don't like math, when you write stuff like that. Well, we don't need all that. That's the technical definition of what a quadratic is. A quadratic is a function that has squared terms in it and no bigger terms, no cubes, no powers of four, no powers of five. I'm looking around the board to see if there's any crazy ones on the board. No, there's nothing here from calculus. We will look at higher degrees. We will look at higher exponents, but for quadratics, we're going degree two, exponent two only. You might not have seen the word degree before, but I'm, I'm just throwing it in there so you get used to it. Numbers that satisfy a quadratic equation are called roots. Those are the roots of the equation. For example, the values of x that satisfied x squared plus 2x minus 5 are called the roots of the equation. Sometimes people call it the zeros of the equation. Therefore, The zeros of the quadratic equation are the roots or the x values. I'm trying to throw the extra words in there so someone doesn't think I'm getting right addicted to certain words here. Because then if I turn around and say, oh, find the x values that satisfy this equation, that upsets people. I thought you said they were roots. They, they're also called the roots. Uh, two different names for it. 
And even on a test, you could ask me, it says, this one asks for the roots. Are those the X values? I'm like, yeah, those are the X values. You know, I'm not trying to get addicted to the words. I'm trying to get used to the words. Any questions about that? And then it gets really wordy after that. I don't think you have to fill anything in here. I just get sidetracked for a minute on the real technical part of this. Comparing quadratic functions and quadratic equations. A quadratic function has y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. It can have all sorts of y values and all sorts of x values. It's a parabola. It's a very wide ranging function. Quadratic equation doesn't have the y anymore. It's saying ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. We're just trying to solve that equation. So if someone said, what are the x-intercepts of this? We'd make the y equal zero and turn it into an equation that we could solve. Could the y value be something else? Yes, and that doesn't make it all that much more difficult. It's not really a big deal if they choose a different y value. So a quadratic function has two variables, x and y, but a quadratic equation, we know what the y is apparently, and now it's just an equation that we can solve. The graph of a quadratic equation is this giant thing on the left here, a whole parabola. Whereas a quadratic equation, we're just going to solve for two x values. We're just going to solve for the x values that satisfy it. So they are slightly different. But here's the important sentence here that I want to highlight. To solve quadratic equations, we often use factoring and the zero product property. Whoa. The zero product property. It's got a fancy name, and it might be the easiest idea we'll talk about. So I'll get sidetracked and talk about the zero product property. Let's play a game. Maybe it's a game show that you're on, and you appear on this game show. And it's your job to figure out the numbers in the boxes. Yes? You don't have to copy this yet, okay? Just check this out. Here's the game. Your job is to figure out the numbers in the boxes. And they say, okay, these two numbers, when you multiply them together, they come out to 12. Three, Three and four. Six and two. One, One and 12. It's way worse than that. Decimals. Decimals. 120 and 0.1. 1200.001. 5 and 2.4. Yeah? I argue this is horrible information. Two numbers multiplied to get 12. We're going to have no chance. We're never winning this game show because we're never going to figure out what the two numbers are because there's so many combinations. We, we didn't even do negatives. Negative 1, negative 12. Negative 2, negative 6. All the negative decimals. Here's the zero product property, okay? Because I'm going to change the game show and you only have to come up with one of the numbers. This is what the zero product property is all about. If over here on the game show, instead of saying equals 12, they tell you it's equals zero. I argue you absolutely know, and it doesn't take long. You're not going to be sitting there going, mm, huh, I don't know what to do. If they tell you two numbers multiply to give zero, you know one of the numbers. One of them has to be zero. Zero, and maybe I don't know this second one, because it could be anything, but I know one of them has to be zero. That's all zero product property is. is if you've got two numbers multiplied together and give zero, one of them's got to be zero. And no other, no other numbers will do that. If you choose any other numbers, if you don't choose zero, you're not going to get zero as an answer. Okay? Pretty, pretty straightforward, actually, with a fancy name. Zero product property, like something really scary is going on here, but there's nothing scary at all. And factoring, oh, good. I'm so glad factoring's back. I really missed it. Thank you, Mr. Todd, for bringing back factoring. Actually, for a lot of people, what happens is you went through factoring in grade 10. You got sort of good at it. Maybe you forgot it all. Then we went through factoring in chapter one and then two. And you're like, okay, still not great at it, but it's coming along. Then we'll do it here. And, and some people, it just starts to click where you go, okay, now I can do this. Can we practice some, Mr. Todd? Yeah, sure, let's do some. To give full perspective, to get an equation like this, Probably what happened is somebody had the, the equation y equals x squared minus 6x minus 16, and they wanted the zeros. They wanted the x-intercepts. 
So they went, okay, I need x squared minus 6x minus 16 equals 0. That's probably how we got here. Now, in grade 9, we made a mistake. We beat you up with isolate x. We made you do it a thousand times, making you believe that all equations solve with isolating x. That is only one of the available strategies. There are many ways to solve equations, and isolating is one of them. But anytime you see more than one x term, isolation is out the window, will not work, cannot use it. This has multiple x terms. So our main strategy we'll start off with is, what happens if I factor the quadratic? on the left. Does that give me any insights into what the x values might be? And the answer is, oh boy, does it ever. So then you got to reach back into your factoring chart in your brain and go, okay, what's the first thing I'm looking for when I'm factoring? Oh yes, 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 that's true. I'm going to make the list over here, off to the side here. I'm going to make a little tiny list. Now, when I make this list, it either goes like this, you're like, oh yeah, I remember now. Or it's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And if that's true, if you really can't factor, then we need to talk. Come at lunch, or when I'm not teaching, and we will, I'll just do some examples and we'll just get better and better at factoring. I promise that factoring is not the worst thing you've ever seen. You just got to practice a little bit and get a plan. Here's the plan. The little plan is, first check is there a common factor? That's always the first move. Second, check to see if there's a difference. Do I have enough room here? Difference of squares. Is this ringing a bell? Three, x squared plus bx plus c. Is it a regular quadratic? Or ax squared plus bx plus c. That's the simplest way I can write that chart. I wrote it in much more detail when we were looking at this in earlier chapters. And I'll gladly go through those details again. But for some people, this is what they need back again. Oh yeah, I sort of remember this now. I just need the little chart that tells me which things to look for. This doesn't have a common factor. It's not a difference of squares, but it is x squared plus bx plus c, which is, I think, sort of what you were trying to say. Yeah. So that type of quadratic factoring, way back in grade 10, when you first learned it, when you first learned that factoring, no one went home and was upset about factoring. Because the only job you had to do was find out what multiplies to negative 16. If you don't need these little notes underneath, you don't need to write them. This is for people who are like, okay, I'm still not great at this factoring thing. Yeah? I need two numbers that multiply to 16, but add to negative 8. Oh, he's already shouting the numbers. If you're good at your multiplication tables, the numbers will just appear for you. Your brain will just go, oh, boom, the numbers. Let's pretend that that's not what's happening for you. You're like, I'm not getting the numbers automatically. You could do one of two things. You could list everything that multiplies to negative 16 and check which one adds to negative 2. So you go, that's what I like. I like doing the factors. So I go up here and I go, okay, 1 and negative 16. That multiplies to negative 16. Does it add to negative 6? No. I can do that in my head, but maybe you've got your calculator out. Then I go, okay, what else multiplies to negative 16? 2 and negative 8. That multiplies to negative 16. Does it add to negative 6? Yes, it does. Okay. Now, if the multiplication is too hard for you to come up with these combinations that multiply, then do combinations that add to negative 6. 1 and negative 7. Does that multiply to negative 16? No. 2 and negative 8. Oh, that's the one. Okay, so just come up with a systematic pattern. And as you're doing that, you might be thinking, oh, I'm not very good at this. It takes me forever. No, no. You're very good at it, and it sometimes takes forever. That's what factoring is all about. So this is x plus 2, x minus 8 equals 0. Somebody else might see factoring differently. They're just like, I just have to make up two brackets to foil out to this. It's just unfoiling. That's all factoring is, is unfoiling. So far, so far. Now the zero product property. Factoring turns this into two things multiplied together. The zero product property says one of them's got to be zero. 
If they're going to multiply together to be zero, one of them's got to be zero. Therefore, x plus two has to be equal to zero. Or x minus eight has to be zero. So I get x equals negative two or x equals eight. Notice that this quadratic that I could not isolate with, by factoring it, I can use the isolation strategy. So factoring is a strategy of taking a degree two, an exponent two function, and breaking it into two functions that are both exponent one, and then dealing with each one on their own. Does that all ring a bell? Am I overteaching it? No, I'm not overteaching it. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad because factoring is weird. Factoring, it, see, nobody walks around and factors when they're walking around in life. You don't walk you know, on the bus going, okay, what two numbers multiply? You know, you're not doing that. And so it, it drops out of practice very, very quickly. So if, it, if you were like, I was good at this, now I'm not good at it. Yeah, I know, it's like that. Factoring is like that. Oh, look at this disaster. x squared over 2 minus 4x. This is just me going, uh, we better deal with some weird situations that actually aren't that weird. Th this thing has got a fraction in it, and that's very upsetting when it comes to factoring. Factoring with fractions, we mostly don't want to do that. And we don't have to. If you have an equation, you don't have to fight with fractions. We tried to show you why in grade 9. We sort of forgot about it in grade 10. So if, if this is sort of new to you, I know something about this situation. I know if I just take this whole equation and multiply it by 2, which I'm totally allowed to do to an equation. I can, as long as I multiply everything by 2, it's totally allowed. And what I get is 2x squared over 2 minus 8x equals 0. You should be unimpressed by that move. You're like, that didn't make things better. I thought you said we weren't going to have to deal with fractions. And I go, yeah, take another look. Look at that thing. 2 over 2. Yes? From here on in, with the, if it's an equation, you don't have to deal with the fractions. Just multiply through and get rid of them. Now, will the answer be a fraction? I guess I don't know. It, it could be. But I won't have to deal with it while solving, because this becomes, ouch, I almost fell down there. Would you have laughed? Yeah, you, no, you laugh. I'll think that's funny. If I fall down, somebody can jump up on the chair, do a big elbow drop, go for the pin, and we'll all, have, we'll all go home. Yeah. All right. Isn't that better? Come on. That's got to make you smile a little bit. Getting from there to there, it's like, Hey, I don't like fractions. Uh, you don't have to like fractions when you're solving equations. Just multiply through by the denominator. What if there's multiple denominators? Well, then you use the common denominator. It will work. It's beautiful. Now you go through your chart. I'm going to cover it up here for a second, you video people. Don't look over there and think about it for a second. What's the first common type? Factor. Common factor. It makes common factoring deals with so many questions that look really difficult but aren't because this doesn't look like any of the trinomial stuff. It's not a difference of squares. It's not any of those things. If you miss the common factor, you're going to be like, I don't know how to do this. And yet it's the easiest question. Common factor of x, and I get x minus 8 equals 0. It's now factored, and I can talk about it using my fancy zero product property. Zero product property says if you have two things, I'm going to underline them, multiplied together, and it equals 0, one of them's got to be equal to 0. So either x has to be equal to 0, or x minus 8 has to be equal to 0. Again, if you're out there thinking, do I have to show this extra step? Can't I just see that it's 8 and jump right to that? I say yes, but be aware of this step, because once in a while you might need it. Do you have any questions about those two factoring things? Because it's factoring examples, not things, examples. What do I got left? I got two more to go? Pretty good day. Pretty good day. And I've been talking lots. I've been over explaining this. I know you're still going to get a nice break here. Do you need more time there?
find the zeros. Okay, so this is one extra step in the procedure. The only difference with these ones is what I'm going to do is go, oh, if I want to find the zeros, set y equals zero. That's the step that wasn't in the previous example. I'm not going to change what I wrote there. I'm just fighting with my pen a little bit, so I got to write a little more carefully to make this pen. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Okay, that, that's the opening step in these sometimes. They give you a quadratic function. Then they say, oh, find where the y equals 0. I put a 0 over there, and then I'm back to factoring again. All right. Oh, I don't have the chart here anymore. Don't peek at the chart. See what you can do to memorize. That's most people's problems with factoring. Which factoring should I do? Does this have a common factor? Is there something that divides into 16 and into 9? No, no common factor. It's a difference of squares. When it's two terms, that's your trigger for difference of squares, is there's two terms. Mm -hmm. Here's difference of squares, coming up here. And again, still fighting with this pen. As I'm writing this, I'm going to go over and see if I have a different pen in my drawer. This is the way I suggest to do difference of squares. If you're looking back at this video to try to find out are trying to remember how to do difference of squares. That's how I suggest. Write the two brackets and then you think to yourself, okay, is there something that squares to give 9? If this is a difference of squares, that better be a perfect square. It, 3. And if, you, and if the number's too big for you, hopefully 9's not too big for you. But if this number was 121, you could square root it and say, what's the square root of 121 and get, and get the square root? So. What goes in these brackets is plus 3 and minus 3. I went after the easier term on purpose. Now I go after 16x squared, but with the same thinking. Is there a number, sorry, is there a term that multiplies by itself to give 16x squared? 4x. 4x. Not just 4, but 4x. Now, if you find that completely confusing, if you're like, why does this work? Well, I'm going to show you why it works. Because it's a short lesson and I have time, I am going to, first I'm going to cry a little bit that none of those pens are working. I'm going to show it's right, okay? Where am I going to do that? Uh, over here in red. This is me thinking, going, does this work? 4x plus 3 times 4x minus 3. When I expand that, I get 16x squared. Oh, that makes me happy. 4x times 4x is 16x squared. Then I do 4x times negative 3. I get negative 12x. And you stop there and go, uh, yo, T, it, it, it doesn't work. My question didn't have any x's. The factored form when foiled does give x's. I smile and go, keep going. 3 times 4x, oh, plus 12x. That's why it's plus and minus, so that those internal terms, those oi in foil, the oi all cancels out. Then the l is 3 times negative 3, which is the negative 9. So you might look at difference of squares a different way now, where you're like, I'm trying to unfoil this thing, but I don't have to worry about the oi. I just need the fl. I just need the first two terms to work out right. Now I'm ready to use the zero product property. If two things, and I'll underline them. If two terms multiply together to give zero, then one of them's got to be zero. Either 4x plus 3 has to be equal to zero, which again, a minute ago, you were just maybe looking at them going, I don't need these extra steps. I can just look at it and see what they are. Now that this one's a little more complicated, you might want this extra step.
where you bring those things down and go, just give me a second here. I'll get these, but I'll just need an extra second here. And then I have to do my isolation. Hopefully these steps don't blow up your brain too much. Well, what I really want is just my old pen to work. That's what would make me happy. Oh. He's back. Okay. Any questions here? Toughest question of the day. So if you've drifted off to sleep, come back for this one. Could be. You could be right. If I want to find the zeros, I first set y equal zero. So I get this mess. Now I need to tell you that the only way factoring works is if, if there's zero on one side. When you get to a quadratic function like this, the zero product property, a fancy name for something that's not that fancy, where is it? I've lost it. It was down near the bottom, wasn't it? Oh yeah, here it is. The zero product property is like on the bench. I'm getting coaching ball hockey flashbacks here. The zero product property on the bench going, put me in, put me in. I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. And you're like, hold on. Hold on. I can't use the zero product property unless one side is equal to zero. And here, one side isn't equal to zero. I got to bring this over. Then I can call a timeout and sub in the zero product property because there's a zero over there. To use it, I need to factor. Let's go through the list. This says common factor, mm, no. Difference of squares, two terms, mm, no. Simple trinomial, mm, no. Here we go. So, I propose several methods in the other chapter. I propose decomposition. I propose to use your brain. Did I offer a third one? There's a window type method that I don't love. There's magic X, which is too magical for me. I know how to do it, but nobody ever remembers how to do it. Decomp, people seem to remember a little bit better, even though it can be a little bit more complicated. Decomp also handles big numbers, no problem. Okay. I'll do decomp, and then I'll talk about how we could have got the answer by just using our brain. I don't mean use your brain like how your parents say, Use your brain, you know, like as if you're being stupid. I mean, like, no, just sit there and go, let me just think this through for a second. Yeah. Here's decomp. Decomp, you go over here and find out another magic number, AC. You multiply the 3 and the negative 15, and here I get negative 45. And then I look for two numbers that multiply to negative 45, but add to the 4. Maybe you got to make a list. Don't be scared of making a list. You're like, is it 1 and negative 45? Does that add to 4? No. Is it 2? No, 2 is not going to work because 2 is not going to multiply to some to get 45. How about 3 and negative 15? No, that doesn't add to 4. 4, four doesn't divide into 45. 5 does. 5 and negative 9. I'm getting excited. 5 times negative 9 is negative 45. 5 minus 9, negative 4, but I'm close. Negative 5, positive 9. So then you go through, you'd break this up, very mysterious, that you break up that center term into negative 5x and positive 9x. I'm literally unfoiling here. This little procedure over here finds the exact right two middle terms, so that this was somebody foiled and got this. What did they foil? Well, to find out, common factor the first set, 
and common factor the second set. And after you do that common factor, you can see the two things they foiled. They foiled 3x minus 5 and x plus 3. That's what they foiled to get that quadratic. I explained that ever so slightly different than I did last time, trying to give you a little better picture of why decomp works. Somebody figured out how to unfoil this thing. All right, the use your brain method. It is possible to go from here to here. I don't say it's better. It's possible to go from there to there by going, okay, if you want to multiply to 3x squared, the first two terms have to be 3x and x. If the l, the l has to multiply in by negative 15, this is either negative 15 and 1 or 5 and 3, and you just keep playing around with them until you find the one that does foil out to this. Some people look at that and go, oh, I can do that. I can play around with the numbers until I get the right ones. I don't want to memorize this decomp thing. Other people are like, I got to keep trying pairs until I find the one that works? I don't want to do that. Well, then you better learn decomp. Yeah, you got, those are your two choices. There are other choices. If neither one of those work for you, come and see me and we'll talk about what the third choice is. It's magic X and oh my. Don't believe the internet. The internet tries to put up special situations. Go, oh, you can just do this. The methods I'm showing you work all the time. Well, once you achieve that, the rest is pretty straightforward. Using the zero property, then 3x minus 5 equals zero, or x plus 3 equals zero. This one's easy. This one's a little more work. But now I have the two x values. But I'm not meaning to rush that. Do you have Z questions about that? I'll be glad to answer anything you want to talk about. They're paying me for this. I'm so good at factor, I'm just going to not even do this homework. Are you out of your mind? Factor. Factor. It's not going away. Advanced functions. Factor. Calculus. Factor. Yeah, factor, factor, factor. Yeah, 